Thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Fraser MacDonald. I'm a product guy in cloud IoT, so the GCP products that touch anything IoT, IoT Core, the IoT Edge that we just launched, a number of the other offerings. And I'm Eric Kahn, the CEO and co-founder of Leverage. We're a big uh, Google tech partner, and we build a platform that allows you to build end-to-end -end solutions really quickly for IoT solutions. We also serve as a system integrator, so we get to see a lot of use cases from, from industry. All right, so Eric and I are going to be chatting with you for the next 45 minutes or so. Hopefully, we'll have some time for Q&A about track and trace at the end also. Um, but we wanted to open up, you know a bit about us, let's get to know a bit about you. Um, so in the audience here today, we're talking about what location means for businesses. How many people would say they are in a company where location is critical to the function of your business? Okay, a big amount, about half of the audience, and it's, it's a common use case. What about um, a company that would say uh, they are considering adding some IoT intelligence into how their business is running? Okay, another big number, yeah. And connected uh, devices are proliferating everywhere, which is one of the reasons that we're launching so many new IoT offerings in GCP. And what about the connection of the two? How many people in the room today are thinking specifically, how can I make something out of intelligence plus some IoT and turn it into a new offering, a new product for my business? All right, yeah, right. So that's spot on what we're hoping to talk about today. So let's kick off with a little bit of context, just some background on what we've been learning at Google and the opportunity we've had to take a look at maps and location and location intelligence over the years. So the maps platform and the maps product over the years has grown and given us an amazing opportunity for insights into location. You can see some of the numbers here. Three million websites are using the maps platform every year. Uh, and consumers, as on the whole, are making searches that are about 20% location-based. So some of that is where am I going, or some of that is what am I looking for, and it's enriched by where you are when you're asking that question. Maps has got 99% coverage of the world, and even in the walkabout Street View product, there are 77 countries covered right now, including, you'll see in the small text there, the Arctic and the Antarctic. So if you've ever wanted to go, now's your time. So the Maps product has given us a lot of opportunity for insight into location. And we're noticing a shift in what location means to companies these days. There was a long time where location meant a spot on a map. It was an XY or it was a lat long coordinate, and that was about as good as it got. But what we're noticing as maps are moving to more digital applications, and we can tie more in information in, is a shift from where you are to the context around where you are. So the first part of tying information in that became wildly popular was live traffic information. And that was something that was not just what road am I on, but where am I going, and how long might it take me, real time. But this gets a lot richer. It's starting to be the difference between not what street corner am I on, but am I in a business district or am I in a restaurant district? And not where is my package in the world right now, but how long will it be until my package is dropped off at my house by the truck with real time traffic updates? And it's a transformation that's taking over everything that has to do with location. It's one that gets even richer as we're moving into the world of IoT devices. So this is a really exciting conference that we've been at over the last two or three days for all of us on the Google team because we've had some incredible announcements and really exciting ones for us to share. You might have seen the Maps platform announcements of an enormous number of rich APIs that can let you take advantage of the same tools that go into consumer Google Maps. And at the same time, the IoT launches in GCP have been very exciting for us. IoT Core is a product that went GA just in the last year for connecting devices. And at this show, we were announcing IoT Edge, which brings machine learning to the edge, where you can do your processing locally, which will get faster response times. It can handle offline circumstances. So a lot of new products are coming out at the show. All right, great. So what we want to do is show how IoT can sort of augment location and why that's important. Uh, so we're going to walk through a series of five sort of classic track and trace use cases and how they can be augmented with IoT. But before I do that, I, I want to tell you kind of what IoT is really aspiring to do, which is essentially we're trying to emulate what humans do right now. So I know I'm standing on this stage. I know it's bright. I know I have lights in my eyes. I know Fraser's to the left of me. 
And that's what we're trying to bring to devices. So that, that sounds uh, very challenging, and it is. And so bringing that awareness adds a different layer. And it's not just X, Y, it's X, Y, and Z, it's X, Y, and Z, and T. It's adding the temperature, it's adding humidity, it's adding all these things. And how do you actually process all that? Where do you process it? And what do you do with that information once you get it to the cloud? So we're gonna walk through five cases here, the first one being fleet management, and how IoT, augmenting a fleet management use case with IoT can actually provide more value to a business or to a consumer. So here's, here's five different things that in a fleet management, which has been around for a long time, it's been called telematics for 20 years maybe now, and, but the odd thing is it's not, it hasn't really penetrated as much as you might think. So the average business that has a fleet probably only 20% of them actually have a fleet management system that they use predominantly to manage their fleet. For instance, when I go to, and this is really true of small fleets of less than 50 or 100 vehicles. For instance, when I land this weekend at BWI Airport in Baltimore, I'll get on one of those buses that'll take me to long-term parking. And so those buses still use a radio and every, as the driver is driving from point A to point B, he's radioing to the control hey, I'm at this intersection, I'm, hey, I'm here, I have three people on the bus, I have all this. So there's all this human handoff that could all be automated in a lot of ways. They could count the people coming on the bus, they could know where the bus is by just putting a tracker on it, but these types of things still are emerging. So there's a lot of things you can left to do to make our all experiences better and more efficient. So let me walk through five ways that fleet management can be augmented with IoT. One of them is around operator behavior and safety. So if you run a fleet, it's really important that your drivers are obeying the law and that they're not abusing your vehicles, causing unnecessary wear and tear. Are they having sudden accelerations or decelerations, things like that. This is really important for insurance. So there's a lot of insurance-based types of discounts you can get now if you have fleet management systems. Uh, another area is, of course, just efficiency in general. Not only kind of where the gas station is, but which one has the cheapest prices, where's my, my next place to plug in my electric vehicle. Routing, of course, has been around for a while, but it needs to be much more real time now. You're layering in traffic, you're laying in weather, you're laying in special events like parades and other things that are affecting your routing. Uh, another one is remote diagnostics and predictive scheduled maintenance. So there are, there are things called CAN buses and OBDs and, and a lot of acronyms that allow you to get remotely diagnostics on your vehicle so you can know, you know all about all the different engine codes, when does it need its scheduled maintenance, things like that. And then the final thing that's actually very important in terms of a business uh, that is running a fleet is right-sizing the fleet. How do you know how many vehicles do you, have, do you need to service the people you have to service? And when do you want to make the decision of lease versus buy? Because a lot of the fleets are leased, and they may decide when they want to run their mathematical models that maybe it's cheaper to buy a certain portion of them. So this all comes into fleet management. And I'm going to hand it back to uh, Fraser for a real life example. Sure. So let's take a look at a real life example of this. What is fleet management in the world of IoT tools? And I want to introduce you to a customer of ours called Mojo. And they're a customer that has built a device that sticks into the onboard diagnostic port of cars. This gives you a couple things. It's got a cellular backhaul, and it's got a bit of location intelligence in it. So like Eric was saying, in a classic world of fleet management, right away, you've got 50 dots on a map that tell you where your fleet is, which is immensely valuable to a business. So how do you take it to the next step of what was useful to them and add in some contextual IoT data? Well, those OBD ports contain a lot of diagnostic information, and they can use it for two reasons. And one is information about the vehicle itself. So you can get the VIN, but you can also get your acceleration and deceleration. You can get when it started and how long it was run for. You can get frequency of usage. And this lets you do a lot of preventive maintenance. This lets you tell individual drivers when they need to go into the shop. This also lets you profile drivers so that you can get a better idea of insurance information. And the second part they did was a behavioral insight because it's not just knowing about the physical machine, it's knowing about how it's used. So this opens up opportunities for new business models. This is opening up opportunities to turn individual cars into a fleet of rentable cars or to turn a uh, monthly payment of an insurance into a pay-as-you-go adaptive insurance plan. 
So by mixing a bit of IoT data in with locations and fleet management, you get entirely new business models. Exactly. So now we're going to talk about our second kind of classic case. And this one is probably one of the hottest topics in IoT right now, which is asset tracking. So asset tracking, most of us think of asset tracking as, as a mobile-only use case, like things are moving around. But it does, it's not necessarily that. And it's both indoor and outdoor. Indoor prevent, presents all types of challenges from a physics standpoint of locating objects and then visualizing them based on floor plans and all this other stuff. So, so asset tracking, very, very hot topic, and lots of technologies, especially on the communications and on the hardware, the sensor side, come into play to actually accomplish that. So I wanted to walk through a few different use cases that we've seen directly from customers that have come to us and said, hey, I'm trying to solve this problem. We haven't necessarily built all these things, but these are kind of what people were asking us. Uh, so one of, them, one of the big things in, in sort of the uh, convenience store and other types of store retail environments is employee labor efficiency. So they're trying to, they're trying to measure, you know, comparing store A to store B with the exact same number of employees with the same sort of total addressable market and neighborhood. Why are, why are, there, why are there such deviances in how much revenue they're making or how profitable they are. So they're trying to sort of put something that they can track the employees and see does activity level somehow, does that correlate well with or poorly with store performance? So we're seeing a lot of those kind of requests. Another interesting one that came to me about three weeks ago, which I thought was really cool, is, is a uh, head of the biology department in the Netherlands wanted to track wildlife. And not just big wildlife, we're talking very small blackbirds that he wanted to put a LoRa tracker on a blackboard, and it turns out in the Netherlands they have actually a nationwide deployed from a cellular carrier, a nationwide LoRa network. And so we're actually working with him, he's putting in a proposal to build a little tiny tracker that has to be three grams or less that uses a printed battery, it's like super, super tiny, it only lasts for maybe a month. Um, and then they put them on these little backpacks on the birds, believe it or not, and they want to be able to track some segment of the population inside highly dense areas. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Supply chain management, sort of the nirvana there is tracking from source all the way to end use. So food is very challenging for that, but there's other types of things like if you're doing uh, manufacturing, you want to track components from one place to the other, all the way to deliver, delivery to the customer. That takes a whole slew of different technologies, but that's a, that's a very, very important use case. Um, when I was talking about fixed assets, that doesn't seem like an asset tracking, but there are a lot of assets that are supposed to be fixed, and if they move, you want to know about it. We had a customer from Central America that was having problems with people stealing transformers because of the metal inside them. And so they wanted to essentially put a tracker on all their transformers so that if they broke a very, very tight geofence, then either a tree fell on them or something else happened, or they most likely were stolen, and now where is it so I can retrieve it before it gets melted down. Um, and then there's, there's cold chain management. In this case, you're dealing with like FDA types of things where you have to maintain a certain temperature across an entire life chain of, of events and movement. And then there's this other interesting use case that came to us where we had a very large company that the, actually the accounting department was trying to see if they could do, automatically do revenue recognition. So they were building very, very expensive equipment, shipping it around the world, and they wanted to know when it transferred from international waters into the waters of a given country because they could actually recognize the revenue then for these millions of dollars of orders instead of waiting for it to go through customs and be delivered at the end site. Again, very, very interesting use cases, but these things actually uh, can save lots of money. So let's take a look at a customer example where this is in action. And it's a, one that I really enjoy because it kind of flips the definition of asset tracking on its head. It's pretty common to think of asset tracking as something where you're shipping a package and it's got a, a start location and an end location and you want to make sure that it's a timely delivery. But this is a company called WatchRx that has a much more valuable kind of asset, and that's helping in elderly care. And WatchRx product is a watch that goes on the wrist, and it's got GPS in it, it's got a cellular connection in it, and the location aspect is pretty clever. If you just took the GPS alone, you're already dealing with a lot of asset tracking use cases. You want to know 
where your loved one is if something's going wrong, and you can also set some geofences if there are areas of concern of walking outside of. How do you combine that with a bit of IoT data? Well, they decided to use this watch platform to also track medication so that they can register what prescriptions are necessary, how regular the delivery is, and get a bit of information on medication compliance at the same time. So you turn this concept of what could be just a location into a location plus all sorts of contextual information which delivers safety to loved ones in retirement communities or in assisted living care or in stay at home. Great. So our next sort of classic use case is utilization and the, this is closely tied with a lot of the other ones as well. But this, this particular one is, is really around typically shared expensive equipment and you're just trying to maximize the use of it or in industrial IoT applications is another very common usage. You have very expensive machinery on, on, on chains or whatever that you need to actually make sure that they're running at all times. So this, this also comes into the predictive maintenance. So if you're monitoring this for maximum utilization, you also want to, want to monitor for downtime. So you need to know when these things have reached certain critical thresholds and you have to get, get, take them offline and then bring other ones online. So it's, a, it's a, both a, a specific to a piece of equipment use case, but also across all the equipment and so rolled up to an operational type of element. You can also use, the utilization can also be used to inform product design. So this is not necessarily strictly an IoT use case, but if you instrument all of the things that your users are using in an IoT system, you can see the types of things they're asking for, and then you may know what types of sensors you may need to add to that solution to give them the data they seem to be searching for. So let's take a look at Vagabond. They're a Google customer you might have heard about earlier in the conference, and they've got what could also be described as location plus intelligence. Now, their product is sensors that go into vending machines, and a platform that allows vending machine operators to know where their different vending machines are and where to do deliveries, but they've also got a good idea of stock. So what does this mean in a utilization context? Well, suddenly, instead of just knowing where your assets are for your drivers to go deliver and make use of it, you get to make use of location plus utilization. In which areas of the city are we getting the best sales? And not just the best sales, but in which areas are we getting the best sales of particular products? You can change the delivery of your product line just by combining a bit of location information with utilization information and get a much better distribution of what product is the right thing to serve at the right place. Route optimization, of course, this is, this is a classic one, uh, something Google just released, uh, sort of enhancements to the routing API. Uh, it works very well. I use it every day when I'm going to work. <laughs> uh, so, so I wanted to kind of give you some two, two sort of oddball uses of routing that are not your standard ones that we actually have uh, some ex direct experience with. So one of them is uh, everyone's probably heard about Bird and Lime and all these dockless electric scooters. So one of the things behind the scenes that happens in bird parlance, they, they, call, they call them capturing the, the scooters. They have, they have people, anybody can basically get, get the bird app, and you can sign on as a capturer of these birds, and you go around at night, at, like after nine or 10 o'clock, you gather all the scooters, which are spread all over a city, and then you bring them back to your house, and you charge them all up, and then you distribute them back out. And each one of these, they are coded red, yellow, and green, which is kind of interesting based on how much of a bounty you get for capturing that bird. So, so this is a route optimization thing where you're actually trying to maximize your profitability and you want your route to get all the red ones where you're gonna get the higher payout. So it's almost like they gamified recharging scooters. So that's, that's kind of a cool thing, uh, as well as just us as consumers that might use these e-bikes or e-scooters to just where, how do I get to one so I can ride it. Uh, another use case that, that we've, we've, we've encountered is, is on car lots. So some of the car lots are gigantic and they have a lot of the same type of cars. So visually you can't necessarily see very far and you want to walk, say you're buying a new car. You're at a Mercedes dealership, there's 300 black Mercedes in this gaggle and you want to find the exact one you want. How do you know that? You're, you might know the VIN but you don't know which one it is. 
So, so we've been working with companies to help build sort of walking directions through open spaces to get to that car in the most efficient way or to visit multiple cars. So if you're a worker at one of these places and you need to actually visit each car for some sort of maintenance activity, you want to know what your walking path is through there. Um, the last one that you've probably heard many times is garbage collection. Um, you not only are optimizing routes for the trucks to minimize you know, maintenance and wear and tear, but you also, you take in other things which, which I didn't know until we started working with a couple companies that the fumes and sort of the air quality around is, not, is also just as important as the fill level. So you can have sensors on the garbage you know, dumpsters and they can, they can detect fill level. There's multiple ways to do that. But you also need to augment that with an air quality uh, thing because you could, if you have noxious fumes coming out of it, even if it's half empty, you want to go get that one first versus one filled with cardboard that's not really bothering anyone other than it's full. Thanks, Eric. This is great. We got birds with backpacks. We got bird <laughs> captures. We're really capturing that critical ornithologist demographic out here too. So let's take a second to talk about garbage. Um, this is a Google customer called the Nabo. And they're doing exactly what Eric was just talking about. Route optimization is fantastic when you know I've got five spots I need to be at or my truck needs to be at today. What's the most efficient way to get there? And you've seen it in consumer use cases because a lot of you use maps in day-to-day -day life. And it's the same concept in fleet tracking and in fleet optimization use cases. What's the next level of optimization? More than just where's the traffic and what's closest between A, B, and C. Well, the next optimization is how quickly do I need to get to each spot? And that's exactly what Enable is doing with waste management. It's a company that's taken bins for uh, commercial garbage, and they've kitted out these bins with sensors that will tell them how full they are. So that allows them to transition their business model from being a pickup schedule to places A, B, C, and D, whether they're full or not, to pickup as a service meaning they can arrive only when needed and their customers don't need to worry about scheduling their garbage correctly. It's a pretty simple change that combines optimization with a bit of contextual IoT information and change the business model for them. Yeah, this, this is definitely a uh, business area that needs some innovation. There's some resistance. We, had, we learned some interesting side notes. So the very large waste management companies, they want you to have to call them on the phone and either stop them from coming because they, they're maximizing their profit by coming out. So they actually want to not innovate in a lot of ways. They're resistant to it. But we as consumers and businesses that use commercial dumpsters obviously don't want that. So it's an interesting push-pull between yeah. you know, breaking an existing business model by adding innovation. So the last one we're going to talk about is reverse geocoding. So everyone kind of understands that you know, a GPS, if you have a view of the sky, you can kind of get your lat long position. But none of us as humans um, really operate on lat long. So for instance, most of you probably don't know the lat long or where we're standing right now. I happen to do a little research ahead of time, and I know we're at 37.7843 degrees north and 120.4007 degrees west. So that's not useful at all to any of us, and I'm almost sorry I remembered it. But it's the, con the context of where you are, like humans and, and everything, we're all related to other things, and that's a much better way of understanding your position and your context. Um, in addition to just GPS, there are a lot of different techniques that have been sort of worked on for many years now um, that allow you to sort of triangulate your position. So they have acronyms like RSSI values, which is essentially the radio frequency energy that's, that's bouncing around. You can sort of tell that based on Doppler and other things. There's time of arrival, there's time distance of arrival, there's angle of arrival. All these different types of techniques can be used if you have enough sensors around and beacons to, to approximate where you are in a room, in a city, and other things. Um, so the reverse geocoding is kind of taking either GPS or taking this triangular data and actually placing it in a room. It's really, it's really interesting when you get indoors because you have confined spaces like this. To be able to say you're sitting in that seat versus another one is very, very uh, interesting and useful data. Do you want to mention the uh, Google call there? Yeah, the, uh, the last point here mentions an HTTP call. And this is a fun one as our last four have been classic track and trace use cases in the IoT. 
This is, for the technologists out there, a very specific technology that you can make use of in Track and Trace. And there's the ability in the Maps Platform APIs to send an HTTP call in with two pieces of, two kinds of information. You can either send in your Wi-Fi SSIDs, so you're sitting in a location and you're a device and you can spot some Wi-Fi networks around you, and you can send those in in an API call, or you're a cellular device, and you are in proximity of certain cellular towers that you know the idea of, you can send those in and get a very good approximation of your location back from the MAPS platform. So this is a technology that allows for location without having a GPS device on board. Yeah, and, that, and that's very important for devices that are challenged from an energy standpoint. So if you're on battery power devices and you're also trying to drive down the cost of devices, GPS, believe it or not, is still one of the more expensive chips on your devices. And they take a while to acquire signal. There's, there's a lot of interesting things that I didn't even know about GPS when you start actually doing it in IoT. Um, and so triangulation and using calls like this to without GPS, get accurate position are, are really, really useful. And I'm sure you guys will be layering in BLE and LoRa and all kinds of other things in this simple call and pretty soon we'll know where everything is. Yeah, there are a lot of new types of location technologies yeah. coming out for sure. Yeah. So let's chat about Pod, this next company. And a buzzword that you might have come across, I mean, nowhere near the buzzword of IoT, but sensor fusion is a new word that's been coming out recently. And it's one I've heard, and it boils down to something simple, which is just saying, let's take multiple inputs and see if we can come to one more accurate conclusion. And that's exactly something that Pod is doing. So there's this old expression in marketing that there are two areas where people will never check their spending. It's children and pets. <laughs> and so you can imagine the amount of effort and the amount of love that goes into pet products and the value of something like Pod's product. So this is a product that allows you to know exactly where your pet is. And initially, the first thought would be, let's put GPS in there, and we can get a rough approximation. But for anyone that lives in a city, you know there are areas where you don't get great coverage. And for anyone that owns a cat, you'll know that they don't want to be found. <laughs> and so especially for animals that live inside, this wasn't a very practical solution. So Pod makes use of a couple different technologies. They take in GPS location, but they also use the reverse geocoding API so that they can spot nearby Wi-Fi networks. And this is a system that Google's got that's constantly updating. That's every time there's a check-in, there's a constant update to know what are the new local Wi-Fi IDs in each area of major metropolis around the world. So if a pet is walking nearby to a number of known network IDs, it can add resolution in a way that GPS never could. Great. All right, so now we've walked through kind of like high level, what are customers looking for, what are, what are industry companies building right now. So we're gonna, we're gonna sort of go a little deeper into how do you architect these systems, what are some of the trade-offs you have to do, and then we'll finish up with a more full-featured use case of one of our customers that's doing something interesting in the, in the boating space. So let's take a look at a high level overview here. This is the major buckets of components that go into every IoT solution, especially ones that are location aware. So on the left, we've got our sensors. And like we've been talking about, a lot of those sensors are not necessarily just GPS these days. Some of the richest information you can get is by adding whatever's relevant to your business. Is it how full the bin is? Is it how much is this car being used? Is it temperature and humidity and ambient data? These sensors are widely available for all kinds of applications, so make sure that when you're thinking about a location solution, it's not just GPS. The communication networks are one that has a growing array. So in Track and Trace, classically, you've got a couple different types of communication. You can either have it locally, where you're scanning a barcode and you know where the person scanning the barcode is or the QR code is. You can have some short range, which is Zigbee, Thread, BLE, Wi-Fi that works for local applications. And there are a growing range of wider range applications as well, LP WAN networks. And that ranges from licensed cellular networks to unlicensed bands, uh, products like LoRa that Eric was just talking about. So depending on the application, the communication networks cover a wide spectrum. The cloud platform is what we're gonna dig into in just a second in a bit more detail for what are the cloud components you need to build a track and trace solution that's IoT aware. 
And user applications are the final part. This is where it becomes useful. You're a consumer product that needs your customer to know where their pet is in an app. You're an industrial product that needs to know where you've shipped all your units off to or where your fleet's going. And user applications are generally a mix of some hosted mobile or web applications, um, or there's something that you're sitting down in front of a console for. Great. So one of the first things we do when we talk to any customer is try to understand what specifically the business need is, because one of the problems in the IoT community right now is we're not necessarily chasing the right problems on behalf of our customers. So listening to the customers up front and trying to understand, absent of technology, what is their pain point, what is the business need so you can provide the ROI they need is critical. And part of that process, when I talk to anyone or anyone on my staff does, is we're walking through kind of this list. So this is kind of like the matrix of thought process that leads us down a technical implementation path. So one of the first ones you have to know is, do you have power or don't you have power? That has a huge impact on, on the type of sensors you use, the type of communications you use. How wide an area are you trying to cover? Are you just covering this room? Are you covering this hotel? Are you covering this city? Lots of different choices between lands and wands there. Uh, how often do you need to update the position itself? How, you know, we're all accustomed with our cell phones of knowing where we are pretty much in real time, assuming we have good GPS coverage. But that burns our battery really quickly. Everyone knows that you know, if, you, if you use Waze or Maps for more than a couple hours, your battery is basically dead. And we've all been self-trained to not let that happen. And so we're all constantly charging in our cars and everywhere else. But when you're a sensor and you're basically put out in the wild for two years, Nobody's coming around to charge you when there's millions of out there. So, so you have to figure out how often do you truly need to update that position to meet the use case that the customer needs. Uh, device costs and, and just the edge capabilities. Do you can you really afford to do edge processing? Can you afford that microprocessor? Do you want to put Linux at the edge? Or do you really need some little 8-bit microcontroller and these devices are going to be $10 versus $100? So that's a big difference and another driver of implementation. Size and weight, of course. Is it really small? Can it be big? Uh, you know, how much does it weigh? The operating conditions. Do you need IP67, which is like it can handle a blizzard and a hurricane um, and some incredible range of temperatures? Or are we talking about a benign indoor environment where it's essentially 72 degrees most of the time and you're not going to get wet? Um, and then the last thing, which is actually probably the biggest pain point for track and trace of all, and it was kind of surprising to us, but it makes sense when you look back, is we're basically taking lots of things that right now are not being tracked in any real way, not, not in a digital sense, and we're adding the ability to track it. So there has to be an association. You have, it's because we, we as a builder or anyone in the IoT business, we know about trackers. We know about the device that, that tracked. But if it's not attached to an object, then it has no value because the business wants to know about the thing they want to track, whether it's chairs or cars or boats or engines. So the association turns out, and it's an operational problem, but it has big impacts on when you go to deploy these solutions. Just getting the organization you're doing this for to actually realize that if they don't attach a tracker to the object they want to attach, we don't know where that thing is anymore. So I'm going to hand this back to Fraser to talk about the cloud, since it's your cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. So let's take a look at some of the components here that we could use to stitch together track and trace and IoT solutions based on GCP offerings. So on the left side of our picture, we've got all of our devices. And like we talked about before, those are kitted out with any range of sensors and communication technologies. But what about once it gets to the cloud? So there are a few options for data ingestion inside of GCP. A really high throughput one you might be familiar with is PubSub. But a product that's built specifically for IoT devices is our product called IoT Core. And what this is is going to provide you two functions. One is it's bidirectional communication with devices, meaning you'll have a secure communication with any edge device that you want to bring along. You'll put a private key on the device, a public key in the cloud, and have an encrypted connection between that edge node and GCP. The second is it will provide an identity for that device. 
So any application you want to build in GCP, you're going to be aware of where this piece of data came from. We're going to have a registry of every device in your system so that you can build around exactly that. So once you've got your data in and you know how to get your data back out to devices if you want to, there are a number of storage products. And storage is an interesting uh, case in track and trace because in a lot of cases, You've got a long term so that you can do your audit trail, but you also need some very real-time updates. And Eric will talk in a little bit about the real-time nature of opening up a mobile app and needing to see where your boat is. And so there are a couple of storage options inside of GCP, um, ranging from longer term and kind of big query style products to real-time databases like Firebase's Firestore. And lastly, on the side, there's the Maps platform. So any track and trace use case is going to be involving Maps. And you might be aware that everything that is built into the consumer version of Google Maps, a lot of that is broken out through the Maps platform API so that you can make use of it in your same business. Everything from displaying the maps to route optimization to advanced resolution on where something is through Wi-Fi and cellular. Uh, the Maps platform is going to allow you to build whatever the front end of that business looks like. Eric, do you right. want to talk for a second about how to wrap that up in a customer? Yeah, product? yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the things, uh, eTech uh, from, from Leverage is here as well, and he's kind of the expert on it. Um, we, we, we were early adopters of Kubernetes uh, and, and GCP in general. And um, we, we basically are, are really, really happy with how Kubernetes is helping us with sort of compartmentalizing each customer and then scaling each customer. So everything that I'm going to show you for any of our customers, but the boat customer, uh, Siren Marina, in a second, every one of those deployments is, is Kubernetes wrapped and managed. Um, and that's been a big sort of increase in productivity and allows us to launch more customers faster and then monitor how they're doing. because. We're signing SLAs for each one of these customers that the system's going to work. So it's, it's pretty important, too, from a bottom line. So, so our last, last thing we're going to do before we kind of open up to questions is, is walk through this customer, Siren Marine. So Siren Marine has been a customer of ours for a couple years now. And they have a very simple value prop. It's, what is my boat doing? So if any of you own boats, and fortunately I don't, but I have friends that do, which apparently is the best situation, uh, <laughs> is, uh, they are very expensive, off mostly unattended assets that you want to know what's happening with them. So you know whether it's bad weather, whether you know a storm blew through, you're 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 on uh, shore power, and now the marina has lost power, and you're worried about your bilge pump not running and your boat sinking. Well, that may get you off your couch and drive all the way there to check just to see, oh, the power is on, or you call somebody and they're not there. So. So this is a real pain point for boaters, is what is my boat doing right now, both from security and from you know, just tragedy happening to it. So premise, they're complex, they're unattended. And you, as an owner, you want to maximize your enjoyment. Or if you're a fleet operator, you want to know what your boats are doing. So if you're renting out boats to other people, maybe they're not supposed to go next to those shoals over there, or there's other areas. So you need to know what they're doing with your boats as a fleet owner. And that's what Siren Marine Solution does. So Siren Marine is completely on GCP, wrapped in Kubernetes. And there are two, two aspects of the, of the application. It's the, a, an actual app you can download from the store. And you have a smart device that gets installed onto your boat. Uh, and it talks both cellular and satellite connectivity. So it has you know, constant connectivity, no matter whether you're crossing the open ocean or just offshore. And it allows you in real time to see not only where your boat is, but all types of conditions. And it's not just a read-only view. You can actually actuate things, which is really powerful. You can actually turn things on. It works with both wired and wireless sensors. And it is kind of the premier. There, there's several companies that are doing this as well. But this is considered the premier sort of IoT application for the boating community. What happened? Did it go back? Oh, so now what I want to do is I want to play you a video. If I can figure out how to get this to work, got to get my mouse up there. Oh, that was pretty easy. Uh, this is just a promotional thing that Siren Mean did, sort of like finishing it off, mic drop and everything. You guys have been very patient. It's the last day of the conference, last everything. You're probably all packed, ready to jump on the plane. So what happened to the slide? Let's go back. Did it not play? I uh, press play. 
Okay. Ah, okay. okay. We are Siren Marine. There you go. We design and build technology that gives you the power to know whether your boat is safe, secure, and ready to enjoy. Welcome to the Connected Boat. We're boaters, just like you. And we know that there is nothing better than being on the water. But we also know that when we're not on the boat, we're worrying about it. Now, you can worry no more. With the Siren Marine MTC, you can connect to your boat from anywhere. The MTC is affordable, easy to install, and simple to use, making it a practical solution for every type of boat, from center consoles and fast boats to cruising sailboats and trawlers. With the Siren Marine MTC, you can monitor critical systems like battery, build, temperature, and shore power, track GPS position, and set a geofence to detect anchor drag or other movement, secure your boat against unwanted entry and theft, and control onboard devices such as lights or air conditioning with the touch of a button. Never again be in the dark about your boat's status. With the MTC, you'll have peace of mind and a better boating experience. Siren Marine. Boat smarter. Get connected. So that's Siren, which is a great example of how you can bring all these pieces of location awareness, but also the sensors on the boat, what's going on with them, whether they're healthy, what they're up to, when they need to be maintained together into one solution, building on top of GCP. Mm -hmm.